Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Painted in Color podcast. I'm co-host Lauren Brown, joined by co-host Mia Araujo and Eric Wilkerson. Today, we're going to go through our artistic process and how we each individually build up our pieces and make the final product from humble beginnings of what it could be, from maquettes to sketches to weird color explorations to self-references. You're going to see it all today. So strap in and get excited. <laughs> I'm going to open my laptop. Let's see if I remember the, okay. You guys can see my screen? Yes. All right. This is my fancy, a part of a, my fancy presentation that I give every time I'm a guest of honor or something <laughs> at a convention. Uh, or these are this is part of the lecture I give whenever I do a presentation to like college students, uh, high school students. Uh, it's just uh, talking about what got me to where I am right now. Why do I do this? Like, is it is it just are you just are you torturing yourself, or do you really love it? Like, why the the hows and whys? So. Traditional influences. I always start off by telling people that um, my introduction to sci-fi fantasy art began the day my father took me to see the movie Star Trek IV, The Voyage Home. I know that dates me, I'm that old, <laughs> but... Uh, I had no, I didn't I I do I didn't know anything about Star Trek before this movie. Um I knew there was a cartoon on Nickelodeon but I didn't watch it because it, I didn't like the animation. Um but after seeing this I was hooked. And that fall uh the fall of 97 of the fall of 87 Star Trek the Next Generation hit the airwaves. And I knew where I was every Saturday from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. for the next, like, 12 years of my life. <laughs> um, watching home, watching Star Trek. Don't call my house on a weekend. <laughs> not going to the mall. <laughs> you know? Wait, does this still happen? <laughs> Is this still your routine today? I mean, honestly, with Picard back on the air, I mean, Star Trek's Next Generation Season 8 is on, right on uh, is on TV right now. So that rule still stands. Don't call my house. Oh, amazing. <laughs> How things uh, have not changed. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I was, I was hooked. But uh, at that, around about that same time, I was also introduced to uh, comic books. Uh, I was uh, a big uh, fan of the work of Wills Portacio, artists like Jim Lee, uh, most of the Image Comics founders at the time, back in the early 90s. Uh, so this is the work of Jim Lee, uh, Wildcats. Oh, we're not seeing the slides change, Eric. Yeah, if you're scrolling through your presentation, I can't it's see any movement. You. It's just the top I just see, one. yeah, I just see the art of Eric Wilkerson still. Oh no! Am oh, I? Oh no! Oh no! Let's do it all over again. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? Let's do it all over again. Damn! I was scrolling and everything. Oh, sorry, okay. we weren't. I wasn't sure. I was like, yeah, I wasn't sure either. I was like, I guess oh, it's gonna start damn. soon. Damn! I was just all listening. Right, so this is the screen I need to show. Oh, there we go. There's art. Yeah, now there's art. Balls. All right, we're gonna do <laughs> Pat, keep this in. Keep this whole thing in. <laughs> the whole thing. We're gonna start. We're gonna do it live, damn we're it. We're doing it live. <laughs> we're doing it live. <laughs> All right. From the top. No messing around this time. From the top. Make okay. it drop. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> all right can you hear me can you see me can yes you... i can hear and see you i see the art of eric wilkerson right now 
like my students like he's just talking we don't see nothing so, <laughs> wrong I guess this one does anything like how yeah it's like i guess this is intentional he'll probably they get to it eventually they never say anything they just look all confused i'm like what's wrong with y'all like <laughs> are you supposed to be showing us something I'm like fuck. that's really funny <laughs> It's great because like they probably have so much faith in you that they're like, oh, surely he knows what he's doing. And yeah. it's like news flash, and none of us know what we're, we're like, doing. We're just gonna take his word for it. It's yep. Like, um and we did that right. same thing to you. So let's let's <laughs> let's start from the top. Okay. So this is a <laughs> presentation that I give uh at colleges and at conventions where I'm uh, an artist guest. So this is the art of me. Um, so traditional influences. I was introduced to uh, Star Trek as a kid. Uh, I had never heard of Star Trek uh, before my, my dad took me to see Star Trek for the voyage home. And at that point, I was hooked. I, I loved that film. And uh, it kind of shaped my, my interest in, in science fiction. I mean, I had seen Star Wars, but, you know, I Return of the Jedi, but this is, the, the movie with the whales was more interesting to me than another Death Star film. I don't know if that makes you know, any sense to the, the true Star Wars people out there, but um, this, I think it was September of 87, that next fall, um, Star Trek The Next Generation hit the airwaves and I was immediately hooked and knew that I was going to watch this show every single night. And I tell, I tell people that I knew exactly where I was every Saturday night for all seven years of Next Generation and throughout the entire run of Deep Space Nine. From 7, 8, 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. every Saturday night, I was home watching Star Trek. So that might sound, that sounds kind of sad, but I thoroughly, I thoroughly enjoyed myself. Um, I was also introduced to uh, different comic book artists uh, at the time. Uh, I was a big fan of a lot of the Image Comics founders. Uh, back in the early 90s. And this is the work of Wills Portacio, uh, who also who went on to create comic books for Image, uh, I think it was called Wetworks and a couple other titles. Um, this is the work of Jim Lee. And uh, he was a huge artist on, on X-Men, created his own uh, series Wildcats, and is now, I think he's like the president of dc comics or something like that but um this is the work of sid me <clears throat> i was in love with his work when i was a teenager and a college student uh for the eagle-eyed uh, person watching this this emergency vehicle was the inspiration for the um the tank vehicle in the movie Aliens, the vehicle that Sigourney Weaver is driving. Um, they just spray painted it black. I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Sid awesome. Mead's influence across uh, film is huge from the AT-AT walkers in Star Wars to Tron, Blade Runner, um, Gundam. I mean, you name it. And he he started out doing, um, you know, industrial design and car design stuff for different automotive uh, companies, and then just segued into film. But his stuff was amazing. This had such a huge impact on so many concept artists. Yeah. Uh, this is the work of Sadamoto Yoshiyuki. Even though I hate this cartoon, I love the designs. You hate Evangelion. God, I just want to punch Shinji in the face. Oh my God. Like, if you hate your dad so much, take your punk ass home oh. with Brian. <laughs> like, I just no. can't, I can't stand him. But people say, no, that's the culture. You got to understand. It's very angsty. I'm like, no, 
I would have just got my 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 bags and left. You like, would not have gotten in the robot. I would have you? not gotten in the robot. The first <laughs> time I saw the the girl with the bandage on her face and she's coming out, and you you gonna give that girl more attention than your own son? I'm out. Anyway, <laughs> anyway I can't. It makes me mad. Anyway, I love focus, it. It's focus, so funny focus. to me. <laughs> All right. Um, this is the work of uh, Masamune Shiro. Yes. Um, so for I mean I I tell I talk to students about this guy and they're like who that makes me really upset that they don't know who that is. I'm telling you. Oh I'm my god. You. So legend people, legend. So I tell <sighs> people like the the creator of Gundam, uh, not Gundam, uh, Ghost in the Shell. Like, That's not Gundam. <laughs> yeah, no, not Gundam. Ghost in the Shell, Appleseed. You know a ton of other uh other manga and and films but you know this is the godfather this is the godfather and when you when you see all that these mobile games and the genshin impacts and all that stuff you're looking at people that are a copy of a copy of a copy of this man so like don't at me uh, it's the <laughs> truth <laughs> right <laughs> um this is the work of Chris Foss. I discovered his work back in in high school, and uh, his work blew me away. Anybody that's watched the third act of Guardians of the Galaxy knows where they lifted all of their color schemes and ship designs and all that stuff for that Marvel movie. It came right out of this portfolio, and. I actually sat through the credits waiting to see his name because I would have been mad. I would have been mad if they didn't give him credit, but they did. So I was like, all right, I can get up and leave now. <laughs> <laughs> so they better. Like they better. Um, this is the work of N.C. Wyeth, another uh, traditional painter. I learned about him in college and just his color sensibilities, his compositions, his ability to show emotion and in a narrative uh really inspired me uh when i was when i was a student uh and this is the work of uh jerome this is a an orientalist painter um he did a ton of wow. beautiful works this is actually in the metropolitan museum of art uh new york city if anybody uh wants to go see this still blows my mind that there's like no digital tools at that time and he did that by hand yeah like, that thing is crazy hand. i mean every <laughs> like the just the perspective the, the perspective birds, just the everything it's unbelievable he's he's sick oh. but he's got a number of works in the met if uh if anybody's interested um and and learning more about about him and the orientalist uh, painters of the time so um, I studied at the School of Visual Arts. And when I got to when I got to SVA, I was using color pencil and watercolor for everything. Uh, that's what I was using in in high school. And uh, that's what I was, you know, that's what I was comfortable with in my first years going into my second year of college. Uh, so, you know, every year we would get Every year, the Society of Illustrators would donate used copies or, or unsold copies of last year's annual uh, Society of Illustrators annual book competition to the school, and we all got to, to sift through it and see what was like the, what the best of the best art looked like. And I was sifting through it, looking for people that worked in color pencil and watercolor, thinking, okay, well, there's got to be somebody out there that's doing this. Um, so I discovered the work of Carter Goodrich. Ah, uh, uh, yes. An editorial illustrator turned concept artist, uh, visual development artist. So anybody that's not familiar with his work, you've seen it. Uh, the, the, his designs are the, you know, his efforts put into various Disney films. Um, I think Hunchback in Notre Dame and on forward. So uh, Blue Sky I think was using some of his stuff or when he was working with them. But then I met this guy. Uh, his name is Marvin Madelson. And 
uh, I some of his some of his students were in my illustration class, and I was putting up color pencil and watercolor, you know, illustrations on the wall for critique, and the rest of the class was putting up these gorgeous, beautifully rendered uh, portraits and things, and I'm like, where are you learning how to how to do that? And so one of the students invited me to his class and I immediately threw out my color pencils and watercolors oh, no. and embraced oil paint. Um, Cause there are, there are two, kind of two ways of learning how to oil paint. There's the learn through osmosis process where you're just going to watch somebody do it. And then they just go, do you understand? And uh, <laughs> you it's like, no, you, no, no, I don't. No, I don't. You didn't say a word. You just mixed paint and uh, did it. And I, I, I don't know what you're doing. And then there's somebody that actually walks you through and says, if you combine this color and this color and this neutral gray, and you are going to get results. And within, uh, well, so I anyway. So after, so while working with him, I was also studying with um, my mentor, Garen Baker who at the time was doing a lot of advertising illustrations and romance covers and children's books and all kinds of stuff. And he is the person that inspired me the most and showed me all the different directions you could go in as an illustrator. Um, and uh, I, <laughs> uh, so then there's Donato, Donato Giancola, was my uh, sci-fi illustration instructor uh, back in the SVA. So basically everything that came out of his mouth was gold and I wrote it down. Um, so anybody that studied with him knows that's the God's honest. Mm -hmm. So this is basically the palette uh, that I was using back in school, like pre-mixing my colors um, and creating my flesh tones or any color in the color wheel, mixing it out, pre-mixing stuff from light to dark. And within five or six months of working with Marvin, I went from using color pencils to doing this portrait of Avery Brooks as uh, Captain Sisko from Star Trek Deep Space Nine. Damn, Eric. And uh, never went back. So fun fact, I got Avery Brooks to sign this, to autograph this painting. Oh, that's Did awesome. you really? I, oh my God, I sat in the front row of a presentation he gave at a, at a, um, a lecture at, what was it? Some, some museum in Philadelphia. That's so and I, it never even occurred to me to get my picture taken with him holding the painting. Oh my God. But I rushed him. I rushed him. As soon as he was done talking, as soon as the lecture was over, I rushed the stage. I was like, Mr. Brooks, can you, I, I did this painting of you in college. Could you autograph it? And then like all the Trekkies, like, like the hordes of them came down with their action figures and whatnot. And I said, Mr. Brooks, I totally forgot. Can you, can you, can I get a picture with you? And I swear to you, it's like the, best memory he just shouts at me no man i gotta go <laughs> oh my god <laughs> no! that me. <laughs> that's amazing that's so much character in that response i love it Seriously. no man i gotta <laughs> no, go no. <laughs> yeah, it's like i understand these tricks yeah. are hardcore I love it. <laughs> but um part of my process the which is what we're talking about today part of my process involved creating proper reference, having solid reference for things that don't exist. It's what my my teacher back in school, that's what Marvin taught me. If you're going to paint something that doesn't exist, you need to understand how light hits the form, how light and color affect what you're painting. And I, in my senior year of college, came to him with this sketch and said, I want to do a painting of a woman sitting in the chest cavity of a giant robot and he said well how are you going to paint that how are you going to do it and i was thinking i was just going to like collage together a bunch of shiro pieces and like call it my own and you know, like just do one of those early ai things oh no um, early ai don't early even. ai just you know just call don't it even own. compare it 
but he he said he said no you're gonna have to build that robot and i was like how <laughs> so he listed off ingredients basically said go to the hardware store you're gonna get sheet metal you're gonna do this you're gonna do that Lord. now mind you this wow. is this is a good five or six years before blogs were a thing before anybody knew about james gurney's process mm -hmm. then all that information was available online if you type the word maquette you might get a movie sculpture pop up online so i was in my bedroom with <laughs> rolls of duct tape aluminum foil and sheet metal and a little uh toy from the art store and i built everything to scale around that toy wow so i have like coaxial cable for my vcr yes a vcr a <laughs> video cassette recorder and like poster tubes with aluminum foil wrapped around it various levels of sheet metal this entire thing is mounted to a stretcher bar like a canvas bar um, it's four feet, stands four feet tall. And this is the top of this head is my mom's salad bowl from our kitchen. Oh my God. And I took a curtain uh, and I taped it to the back to the wall and I put a, I mounted a spotlight with a tripod. So I completely understood how the light would hit the metal and how there would be reflected lights on the tubes and bounce light from the other wall and all these other things I learned in the time that it took me to do just the the just the sculpture for this. Um, the final painting was kind of crude, but at the time I thought, man, this is pretty good. You say uh, kind of crude, and it's like this. But like, this is the first dynamic, piece. yeah. This piece got me into Spectrum for the first time ever. Yes. So right out of college, I got into Spectrum. And that kind of like set me off on my career. But like I had already done the concept design for what the robot was actually going to look like. So mm -hmm. this didn't have to look like my final design. This was just for lighting information. Mm -hmm. And I tell students that today, like if you're going to paint something that doesn't exist, you're going to need proper reference. Yeah. So that was the end result of that, uh, of my time at SVA. And this is me. Oh, baby Eric with a, a baby Eric <laughs> with terrible with a... posture. I mean, yeah, I say, I know. how is your bag still like working <laughs> all these I years? No, but <laughs> I had, uh, you know, a full head of luxurious baby curl hair, it was, <laughs> you know. Um, all of my photo references, no iPads available for that. Just a bunch <laughs> of Walmart photos taped to the taped to my canvas. And uh, yeah, that was that's that was my that was my process. So today, let me see if I can share my screen here. Today, I want to show you. Can you see this? Can you see? Yeah. Okay. So Sick. this is a recent magic card that I did uh, for uh, the Kamigawa set. Looks like Kamigawa. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, that one. Um, and so they, I had the world guide and I had the, the concept design was already done for me, but the art director threw a curveball at me and said, okay, well, the woman has to have a robotic uh, like a cybernetic connecting arm, a robotic arm, but we don't want it to be, um, we don't want it to look like the arm in the world guide. So design, you have to redesign the robotic arm because somebody else is already using the arm that's in the world guide. So you have to redo, come up with your own design for it as long as it, but it has to stay within the aesthetic of, you know, the design for these characters. So um, I took the time to, uh, oh, actually I should, I should probably share this. Okay. 
um, I took the time to sculpt my reference for this. Can you see my screen? Can you see this? Yeah, see oh things. yeah. Okay. So this is my little maquette. Oh, I can't see the, I just see all the oh. thumbnails right now. Yeah, I don't see the pop-up. Oh, I think it's still loading, it looks like. Hmm. Let's see if I share that. You see oh this? yeah, yeah. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Oh, cool. So this is my maquette and I tried to light it inside uh my house but that wasn't working out and i didn't have the proper lens for it and all that stuff i was learning along the way but i took it outside mm -hmm. at the right time of day that kind of matched the painting that i wanted to do and i got a piece of construction paper orange construction paper so i the light from the sun was bouncing off the construction paper and back into the underside of the of the maquette which gave me my orange lava glow uh, that's in my painting. Um, I, you know, sculpted it with Super Sculpey and painted over it with a metallic paint, uh, brushed it on. Uh, so I had solid information to go from before uh, painting. And this is basically how I do my stuff. Um, I use a like a little flashlight from my phone to give me a little bit more under lighting. Nice. But like cool. this is the work I put in. So it's just a piece of aluminum foil that's just been rolled up and spray painted black. <laughs> so we get that kind of rocky um look to it. That's smart. But that's what I go through. How long do these usually take you, Eric? The... This is like me posing. <laughs> oh, that's great. I love that. Um the the maquette itself, this doing yeah. this is like a day. Oh wow, yeah. that's fast. And, that is fast. You know, and then I put a lamp on the floor, a colored light on the floor just for lighting information for the, my face. This is my junky old studio. <laughs> um but and those that's... pictures of your daughter in the background. <laughs> Yep, this is my yeah, this is my baby, and then these are all my awards for best dad and stuff. Oh, cute! <laughs> but that's that's basically it. I'm like taking pictures the of Mel and all this other stuff, but you know the end result is is that. That's yeah. so, so cool. Um, so my process has evolved a little bit as far as my my the the way i paint or i think more importantly the thing that has changed in the past 20 years since i did the that robot maquette or that robot sculpture is just my the speed at which i work mm -hmm. and my confidence level like i'm not sitting there staring at my screen going or staring at the painting going okay what do i do next how do I do this? And having to sift through art books and try to figure out how to paint something. Um, and, and, you know, a lot of students would probably understand this. Like there, it's not a issue of not knowing how to paint. It's a confidence thing that yeah. holds a lot of people back. So um, with experience, with time, with practice, you can just dive in and just do it. So like a maquette, like just sculpting a robotic arm might take somebody a couple of days if they're just trying to do it for the first time. But I have a whole shelf full of maquettes that I don't, they're junky little maquettes, but I don't, they get, they get the job done. But anyway, that's my long winded speech about how I do my thing. That's cool. That's really cool, Eric. It's so much work that goes into it. My process is nowhere near as sophisticated as this. Oh. Um, but I'll <laughs> stop the share. Yeah, I love the amount of like the fact that you make your own references to do photo shoots of and like with your, you know, with your lighting and everything. Not everybody does that. Like a lot of people will just like do the poses and have the, you know, the photo shoots and everything. I do that stuff, you know, all the time. But in terms of actually making your own props, like that's that's something that's like next level. I love that. It's really, really cool. 
I'm I don't even want to like show my process anymore. And I'm embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> you and me. Both. Everybody's different. Everybody's got their their way. Yeah, That's so why. <laughs> you get results. You get results. Right. <laughs> And all our stuff looks very different. So we're going to have a different process, right? Of course yeah. we will. I'm trying not to feel self-conscious about it. <laughs> but, you know, I, but yeah, but I mean, your process, your your art got got you to where you are. So yeah. don't you even... hush, you stop that right now. <laughs> you shut you shut your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> all right. But um, I can go ahead and share. Um, I'm not going to have like a nice, like puts it, I don't have a presentation ready or anything, but oh, I wish I, do I have the sketches? Oh, good. I have the sketches here. Hold on. Give me one second. I just need to organize this file so that I can actually show it off. Yeah. Um, unless you want to go first, Mia. Oh no, mine's in shambles. Like I can have to do the same thing. So you might as well do it first. In shambles. Oh God. Okay. It's like just a bunch of files and I don't know which order I'm going to show them to you guys. in. so <laughs> to figure that out. Yeah, that's fair. Um, Okay, I'm going to share my screen. So the one the one that I'm going to be doing the, I guess, demonstration of is uh, one of my favorite pieces I've done called The Mushroom Queen. Um, that was like, I think I told the story before on my interview episode, but it was basically the piece that I had done after going through almost a year of straight imposter syndrome and psyched myself out of creating anything. And one day I sketched this queen and first in my sketchbook, and by the way, this was like the third iteration of her. I have two other versions of her that were like completely different, but it was the same concept of this. I knew I wanted like a queen of mushrooms and I didn't quite know how I wanted it to look like. And so it took me, it was, it was basically like a few years I would come back and revisit it. And when I made the sketch in my sketchbook, I was like, I think that's what I want. Like, this is really cool. So she's the one I went with. So it started with this world of mess, basically when I just like do a super loose sketch with a basic composition and uh, just like to get the sense of the mood and movement that I want. And I was like, okay, I know she wants it. I know I want her to have a big floppy hat made out of the, you know, the, the bridal, uh, I think, I think it's like the bridal gown stink corn mushroom um, and a bodice with like that, like, you know, same kind of pattern to it. And I want all kinds of mushroom varieties in this piece. And um, like, that's all I knew. And I wanted it to be very nouveau. So I would do like some refinements of the sketch and then I would do a cleaner sketch um, going over this this nothing thing that I had. Um, I would just like rough this out with like, I think at this point I did have some references of myself hold like with my hands and everything. This is definitely very clearly me. Um, but the actual mushrooms and the composition and everything, this part of the sketch required a lot of referencing because in my pieces, what I really like to make sure of, because I love illustrating plants and I love plants, is that I am using references of real mushrooms. I'm not just making these up. So I have a huge collection of just like photo references from like everywhere, because obviously I don't have access to all these varieties of mushrooms. But here is like the the bridal gown fungus. Um, you know, like I can't remember the names of the, all these now. Here's some turkey tail, some oysters, um, some enokis, and I just like collected shots and shots and shots of all of these um I'm like almost afraid to show my own reference because I'm like I don't know what state I was in but yeah just like a bunch of different mushrooms like some illustrations of mushrooms even I just wanted I got a pack of you keys. oh nice <laughs> the food mushrooms which are featured in this piece um you know so I I found a way to get everything and I think this file doesn't even have all of the references because I had to compress and flatten over time so it didn't get to oh here it is Here's my idiot self um, in like shorts or whatever. <laughs> and like I did zoom ins of my hands and like how they how they were posed and everything just to make sure that I had everything right. Um, my lighting schemes are not as detailed and realistic as Eric's are. So I take a lot of liberties with my lighting, uh, you know, for better or for worse. But it is always good to have a good lighting scheme. But I do need to have really good hand reference and, you know, some body reference as well. Um, and so it was just enough to get the face and the hands and like the, ar the arm position down. Um, and so then this is the re more refined sketch. I can, uh, this is like 20% right now. So that's what that sketch looked like. And then that was the basis of which I built the illustration. So afterwards, what I usually do, oh God, don't look at that. That's, that's next, is I take it and I did line art 
on all separate layers because I knew that I wanted to have each of them be in different colors. And so all of these are separate. And I just basically like go really, you know, like I use the movement of the original sketch and of the refined sketch to translate into how I'm comp composing everything. And I'm heavily using my references, but I'm also modifying those references to to suit my best needs and put them where I want to put them. So um, that's basically how I built this whole thing up and every single thing is on its own layer. I have to say, this is probably one of the most organized files I've had <laughs> and it's still a bit of a mess, but I did everything to build it up because I knew that I wanted to have the maximum amount of control, which obviously takes longer, but it's definitely worth it um, when I'm doing a piece like this because I think I balanced the, uh, the line art and the colors of the lines uh, probably the best. And so after this process is done, let me go through it. I take the line art and I merge it all in one. And I had all the colors that I applied to the previous and just like put it all in one shot. Um, I keep those layers just in case I need to use them again and modify and change it because I can always merge it back down. But that's the basis with which I built uh, this whole thing. And so then afterwards, I have this awful, awful poopy color layer that I was trying to do and it wasn't working. And I was like, why aren't my colors harmonizing? What is this? This is nothing. This is so nothing. Um, but the reason why this was bad was because I wasn't thinking about any value structure. I wasn't thinking about any way to modify or like to, to build up my colors and where the focal point was going to be. I was just slapping in color because I was just, I was trying to figure things out. And clearly you can see that this is not working. This is, this is off. Like the values are all over the place. Um, this is not, this is just not good color composition. And to show you why it's not good color composition, I'm just going to take it down really quick. And like the black and whites are not so bad, but it's just, this is just a mess. This is nothing. This is a mess. So I was like, okay, like this isn't working. I'm going to need to do this again. So what I ended up doing the second time, um, and I wish I had those layers, I can't show you. But what, what I ended up doing the second time was I actually used one base color with which to build everything off of and did a quick value study so that I could see that it was reading from far away. And I used that base color as the local color for everything else that was in this piece, which I believe was, I think it might've been this, this orange that I had. So this was like the flats that I used to put on top of that base color. Unfortunately, I took away that layer, so I can't show that off, but already this was starting to work a lot better because it was feeling more unified. And then um, I started to build on top of it. And you can see how it started to come together when I started to render. I was also using um, this local teal color as my bounce light. So you can see that reflecting in a lot of these like mushrooms and how like this, it was like this kind of like magical light that was coming from somewhere. And it was reflecting off of all these uh, mushrooms. And so I built up my values that way. You can see the teal layer coming in here. And a lot of these layers I didn't name. Don't judge me for it. It's too many to keep track of. So, you know, whatever. Um, and where's my background layer as well? And there she is. Yeah. And so this is how the piece started to come together. Some of my liner is missing. There it is. And I think that I have another layer on by accident. There we go. Um, and so like this one was a lot more controlled because I also used the colored line art to really reflect off of everything. Uh, that I was building in the color value. So I could tweak and change and modify as I needed to, to change the balance. And it's amazing when you have a line art detailed style, controlling the colors of your line art does wonders for your overall composition, because then your line art is more married to the colors rather than one overtaking the other. And that's what you want when you have a line art heavy style like I do, because inking is like my favorite part of the process. I lose myself in it. I like let myself be as whimsical as I want when I'm inking. And so I want to preserve that fidelity when I'm doing my colors, um, but I also want to be able to render without overtaking it. And that's how I achieve kind of harmony between those two things. So that's essentially, uh, that's my process. And yeah, I just put the post effects and everything. Um, oh yeah, here's like one of my color layers that I had. And I, I didn't use it in the end, but there's just like, these are just ways that I kind of like harmonize over time as I like make sure that I'm sampling from the same source. Um, I had a white fidelity layer. I think I can't remember if I used it or not, but it was like to keep the artificially keep the hand separate in case things were getting lost. It's like the way that I play around with the overall illustration. And yeah, I think that's, I think I was able to click up to the final piece. 
but that's how it came out. So yeah, <laughs> that's essentially my process in a nutshell. Sometimes it modifies and changes. That's my process um, so far. And sometimes it's evolving and changing and growing, but I didn't have like really any consistency until I think maybe like 2014 uh, in my career. So I started to get a better process when I started to unify and color my line art and um, and make sure that everything was feeling married and harmonized. And um, what I really wanted out of my art was to make you feel invited into kind of like a more like a soft dreamscape of Fay Wild plantness and uh, this like whimsical sense of movement. Um, because I always I've always wanted I've always loved animation, but I never wanted to be an animator because I was like, this is, I just want to draw one piece. And so I was like, let me put all the movement in one piece. And so that's like my mission statement, basically, <laughs> as well as just like, you know, enrobing you in a world of plants and teal and soft colors. And I just like wanted to feel like very easy to look at, easy on the eyes. And, um, and that's how I achieved that look. So I hope that's helpful to see my process. That's so amazing. I've actually never seen your process. So it's so cool to finally see it. And cool. I, I was curious how long the line art takes because that seems like the most labor intensive, if I'm not mistaken. It's uh, funny because you would think that. Um, Ivy and Oak took two and a half hours to ink. Whoa, that's so fast. Yeah. And I think the Mushroom Queen took probably around the same amount of time. Like the colors take about an extra hour and a half, but the base line art takes usually takes me usually about two hours. I told you, I love that part of the process. So I just flow. That's amazing. And so like, the, yeah, because <laughs> the main thing for me is to have a refined sketch. And if I have a refined sketch, I don't have to do any thinking when I'm doing the line art. So it helps me tighten up everything. It's incredible. Stylization is incredibly hard. Yeah. And yeah. It, I mean, pulling it off, but then pulling it off consistently oh my god yeah it's like you got to have rules for yourself i think yeah. yeah is really what it is like whether they're subconscious or intentional yeah because if it's not consistent it just looks like one really good drawing and like five bad ones yeah <laughs> like, what's yeah. wrong with his face like oh god but and also people oh sorry oh no. go on mia no, I was just going to say that people tend to, that don't know much about drawing or painting, tend to think that line work or like stylized work is easier than photoreal work or more representational stuff. And it's actually just as difficult because you need to know all the same stuff that you would know for representational work, but then you have to be able to distill that into like shapes that feel like they are, you know, that are showing that knowledge. And that's actually really hard to do. <laughs> Yeah, it's like, it's it's so funny when I see a lot of people talking about like, oh, like, you know, this, this style is so simple, this cartoon is so simple, like, why can't I just do it? And it's like, you don't understand all the foundational study that had to go into breaking everything down and keeping it consistent and proportional while being hyper stylized. Like, it actually takes, um, it takes a lot of effort to be able to get that to look good. Because if you don't have any basis of foundation, it's going to fall apart really quickly and it falls apart easier because it's simpler. So it's deceptively difficult to do stylized work, especially when you're like really condensing it down to like simplistic, chibi, anything. You have to have an understanding of human anatomy and the foundations, composition, everything, design, like all of it. So yeah, because I can do a realistic face, no problem, but I don't want to. So I learn how to do a realistic face and then I do stylized things. Yeah. Yeah. So what about you, Mia? I would love to see your process. So I love your, I love your art style. Oh, thanks. Well. Um, I'm going to share an, uh, like a, a commercial piece because, or a piece I did for a client because I can't share a lot of my recent work, but it's a similar process to what I do. Um, I just have to take a second to put these all in the same. Uh, oh, no, you're all good. Sorry. Hang on. My it's favorite. fun seeing like behind the scenes though yeah um, of each of us this is gonna work Can you what? i'm trying to figure out how to open these all in one in one uh preview window and for some reason it's not letting me hang on oh no can you share you can't share your entire screen right on on zoom yeah That's you should one. be able to really i usually share my entire screen 
I was trying to, to do that. That's what I thought I was doing. But then it was like, no, you can only share individual things. Yeah, it's doing the same thing for me too. And that's why I'm trying to throw them into, if you guys will bear with me, I'll just take a second to do this real quick. Oh, no, no problem. Again, we yeah. can just edit this out. Yeah, we don't want you to get into your full speech and then be like, oh, we're, we're not seeing a thing. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. We betrayed. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, you guys want me to tell you tell you tell you something cool that's yeah. about to happen while we're while we're killing time? What? Yeah. So um <clears throat> even though I didn't get in, so I told you about that um the museum? The African the Afrofuturism exhibit that's gonna yeah. happen at the Smithsonian. I got invited to the um opening reception. Oh, really? Yeah. Are you an honored guest? I'm an honored guest. That's amazing, Eric. That's awesome, Eric. Oh, so, yeah. The Smithsonian sent me an email yesterday, like, like RSVP, and I'm like, what? hell yeah. It's what is life? That's so, That's fancy. so cool. So, um, I messaged Dang, a friend of mine that's actually in the show, and a friend of yours? Yeah, my friend Tim. 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 Oh, Tim. Oh, Tim Filter. We Tim know is, Tim. Yeah, Tim's in the show and he's in the um the the catalog that goes along with it. And he thought that he was going to get a plus one. So he's like, I gotta email them and and ask him if I could bring my wife because if I if I can't, then I'm gonna hear about it. And I'm like, Yeah, you sure yeah, are. You definitely <laughs> will. So um, so I emailed them to see if I could get a plus one. Um, but yeah. That's awesome. that's I'm excited. So that's I awesome. Get, to, get a chance to meet meet people at the Smithsonian, and I feel like I should print up some business cards or something. Yeah, you should have them on hand, just in case. Bam! Like this is what this what this is what could have been on your walls, but <laughs> but instead nah. you didn't go with me. Yeah, jerks. <laughs> yeah. All right, I'm finally ready, guys. Sorry about that. Okay. I wish I could show what I'm working on now, but it's yeah. confidential. You'll share it soon. I'll share it is one it day. For, is it for work work or just just? It's for just... uh, some, it's for something else. Oh, okay. Should talk about it off air, right? Yeah. Cool. All right. Let me know if you guys can see this window where it says Mexican Gothic here. Whoa, yes. So this was the original cover for Mexican Gothic, which is the best-selling novel by Sylvia Moreno Garcia. It came out, I think, in 2019, 2020. I was commissioned in 2020 to do a step back illustration for the interior. And so um, the first thing I did is read the entire book. <laughs> I bought the audiobook because it was out, you know, uh, and I listened to the audiobook. And um, the author actually sent a bunch of reference over to or like, you know, pointers for refs. So I was building boards like reference boards based on the main character, trying to understand she's a indigenous Mex Mexican woman from like the 1950s, you know, so she's very stylish and stuff. And so just trying to get a sense of what she looks like and who she is and how she'd be posed and stuff like that. And I did a bunch of studies based on that. And then they also wanted it to look like this illustration to look like a Giallo horror movie poster from this era so it's one of my favorite genres of uh, horror horror films so it was definitely like a dream project so it was really fun finding all this like visual ref of that style of poster you know um and I don't usually work in this kind of uh, style either so it, it was actually really fun to try to figure out how I would make this my own you know um so these are some of my first sketches and you see some really rough doodles, like just chicken scratch. And it's just like ideas in my head, you know, the, the first things that came to mind when I was reading and stuff. And then little notes uh, about all the elements I wanted to try to include. And um, from there, I tightened up. This is a few steps later, but it's like I tightened up my four favorite concepts into ideas that I submitted to the art director. Um, so gorgeous this is sketches. Oh, thanks. <laughs> this is first round of sketches. Like when they say those are due, that's all the process up leading up to that point. And then they chose one. Um, actually, in this case, they chose two. So you could see he circled uh, these two. And, and for the one on the bottom middle here is he added in the house, like in the gutter, because it was supposed to be a wraparound, not a wraparound, sorry, a double page spread. So he was uh, suggesting where to put in 
the architectural element, like the mansion. And then from there, I've actually never drawn a frightened expression because <laughs> he was saying she should look more frightened than some of these, like she looks a little bit too posed, you know? And so I was actually just trying to loosen up and do some sketches and uh, try to get a, you know, get that expression across. Um, and then just gathering some, some reference for the lighting just from Pinterest and stuff. Um, I actually didn't put this later. I, I actually also hired a model, but that reference is later. So I'll show it later, but I basically hired a model and it was during the pandemic. So I actually sent her my sketches and gave her a bunch of directions and we did a virtual photo shoot. So she took photos of herself and emailed or, you know, Dropbox me all the files and um, I paid her for that and stuff. And she also wanted a, a print of the final piece at the end too. So um, she was amazing. She did an amazing job with it. Um, we'll get to that later. Um, so then color comps from the photograph, just trying out different moods and lighting situations and stuff. And so I submitted this to the art director. Um, the, oh, sorry, that was out of order because these were <laughs> these were the first pass, which was really not working <laughs> and, went, <laughs> and went to this. Like those are uh, the ones I went with. And so he liked the red and green. So I did two more um, and he chose the one on the right. So from there, I started putting my all my reference together. So there's my model with the pose. Oh, wow. And um, just do my own hand for hand reference as she's holding the lantern. Because I think the, the lantern was an, a late addition that he suggested. Um, and just some little rough sketches of what the lantern would look like in the bottom right. Um, one last digital color comp <laughs> before I start painting traditionally. And I don't have a bunch of images of the in-betweens uh, of the painting itself. So here's like the rough sketch, oh, the line drawing, which is gorgeous. Really rough. <laughs> gorgeous. And that's how it ended up. So, you know, not much process in between that. But um, yeah, I painted this one in acrylics and because I actually had time to do that. But in a tighter deadline, I would have done all of it digitally. But mm -hmm. um, yeah. I feel like you did just do... Um how to draw an owl like first draw a circle <laughs> and then draw the rest of the owl it, it, it went like so obviously after this port, part to this it actually did go through a lot and I I just didn't want to overwhelm me with all the fucking process pictures <laughs> but I, mean, uh, I want to see all of it so that was your first book cover right my first book cover was like back in 2009 2008 um okay. and it was uh like I did that one traditionally too um but yeah that was this was my first book cover since then so it was like 11 years later <laughs> yeah that's um, fantastic wow I love all the the sketches all the possible ways that this could have gone yeah I like some of those other ones like the underground one I kind of wish they chose that one because it was more surreal like it, that's totally like my gallery side like right like just getting into the sketch and wow. uh, you anyway. gave them so many sketches <laughs> I yeah know. it's you do a lot of sketches you do oh a lot God. of sketches that's wild yeah I mean it's great because again it's like good planning so you know you can kind of just like do you do you feel like you can just flow once you have the color comp of it all set up in digital or do you still like have to do a lot of additional problem solving I mean I'm still figuring stuff out like in in a in a lot of ways so I feel like the sketches are more for me so it's like I know because I don't build maquettes right it's like my my way of figuring out the information I need to paint is through sketches and through gathering reference and doing different color studies and stuff um, like I I'm almost like rehearsing the piece before I do it you know especially yeah. if it's traditional because if it's digital yeah I could keep adding more layers and refining and stuff but uh, and I, and I, you know, you can paint layers traditionally too. I just, I just like to leave as much of that guesswork as possible, like out of the equation, especially if it's for a client. So they know exactly what they're getting because yeah. traditional paintings just take so long. And I don't want them to tell me to redo or like add a lantern midway through the painting. I would rather they tell me that during the sketch process, which is what he did, you know, mm -hmm. because I gave him many opportunities to weigh in, you know, but yeah, um, but yeah, when it comes to it doesn't always work out that way either like um you definitely get some ad's that will give you input in the middle of a painting <laughs> <laughs> yeah we are cautioned to not do stuff like that because that's just not fair to the artist like it's the ad's job to be able to catch things when they're still in their sketch phase so that we're not doing thrash but sometimes the project needs will change 
And so you have to change things that you can't, can't control. Um, and it's good to have like, you know, a lot of different references for different things and be able to pivot when that happens. So yeah, it's, it's really cool to see that up close though. <laughs> I feel like, like you guys though, I mean, my process was, or at least maybe like Eric, my process was similar maybe in school, except not as detailed. Like I, you know what? I take that back completely. Cause back when I was doing gallery work, it was so haphazard in the sense that I would literally just start doing a stream of consciousness drawing. Like I do the sketches and the sketchbook and stuff and the, and the words and the margins or whatever. But when I decided on an idea, I would just start drawing the final drawing. And it was like a stream of consciousness thing. And I'd be like, yeah, I guess that's it. And then I'd gather reference. Um, I would do color comps that I would then just not follow <laughs> and <then laughs> bring the color on the final painting and paint over. I remember painting over like a two foot dress, like oh, different colors over and over again. It was like such a waste of time. Oh no. So I literally learned this through trial and error of just like always being up at the wire, at, you know, at the down to the wire, just like, why is this always happened to me? And I just think over the years I've added more steps and maybe I will eventually get to maquettes. You know what I mean? But it's like. <laughs> I mean, I would love to get to the point of maquettes too. Like, I feel like I could definitely always use more references. Um, references are great. And sometimes I under-reference for sure. Um, a lot of the time I do actually. But when you have proper reference, it's like, it makes such a difference. Uh, it really does. And yeah, I don't know if I like have often have time to make my own maquettes because I don't do this full time. But I would love to be able to do that one day and just like dedicate like, you know, some energy and time to like make shifting stuff and getting going to the hardware store and getting the things that I need and building stuff. I probably don't need to go to the hardware store. Let's be real. I just have to go to my sunroom and get a plant because that's what yeah. <laughs> that's what I use for reference. Honestly, um, I I mean, I have a lot of different varieties to choose from now. Like, obviously, mushrooms, I don't have that. But, like, for any of my other plant drawings, I have ivy outside. I have, um, you know, I have, like, all kinds of, like, vining plants and there's flower things. And, you know, I live in Atlanta now, so there's a lot of sources of inspiration around and, you know, rotten, petrified logs in the, in the woods. And I can just go in there and take reference photos and kick them apart. It's great. It's awesome. It's amazing. Yeah. That's actually a great point. Like if there are any kind of locations that are within access, you know, like if there's a botanical garden, for instance, that I need plant reference, I absolutely do that, you know, and just make a day trip and hang out with friends and take reference or whatever. Yeah. Um, I do the self-reference too. Like I actually took photos of myself for the model in the poses and I'm like, I need your face doing this, but <laughs> just, <laughs> just look at me, embarrass myself t- taking photo rep. I think every artist I know does those, you know, Oh, like- <laughs> 100%. I did. I did some very obvious self-referencing for the Shuri cover that I did um, for Marvel. And like, it was so funny because my family was like, it's you. And I was like, yes, it is me. <laughs> but also it's actually Shuri. <laughs> it's like, should be quiet. They can't know. It's like, it's fine. But because like every artist does that, like we, if, especially if the character already kind of looks like you, it's like, well, I can just take my face. And of course it's going to end up looking like you if you heavily reference your face. Yeah. So, um, you know, it was like a fun little consequence of that. And sometimes but, you can't afford yeah. to pay for a model either, you know, or the timeline is too short. And so you just have to wing it. Absolutely. So you just make do with what you have, but resources are literally everywhere and tools are literally everywhere. Um, you know, people can make masterpieces with just a pencil and paper, um, or like MS Paint. Like I've seen some people do some crazy thing on MS Paint. You can make it with anything. So it's just like, how do you best make your process of like how you enjoy to draw work for you? Like, because I love doing line art, I found a way to make line art work best for me in the way that I wanted to see my illustration shine. And so it's just like, you know, I think part of the style too is like taking the things that you have an affinity for and leaning fully into them and making it your own. I think that's the most fun part of the process actually to see how it comes to life. Yeah. It says a lot about you as an artist. Yeah, yeah, absolutely it does. That's what I love about how different all our processes are. Like it is specific to who we are. It's great. <laughs> yeah, I really like it a lot. So yeah, I think like, I, I want to see like more like of your processes now, like on future episodes and stuff like that. I just want to see, I like peeking behind the curtain and really seeing like why, you know, we chose things and how we built something up. It's just something really, um, I don't know, it's inspiring. And it's also making me want a better process because <laughs> now I feel all self-conscious. <laughs> works in progress, Lauren. It's all good. <laughs> it's all works in progress. It's fine. <laughs> it's, 
I I mean I I could I could not be so rigid with it, but my time is so limited when I when I'm in here to actually paint. Yeah. Now that if I don't have a roadmap, a game plan, I've just wasted that whole time. And yeah. I can't like I've seen I've seen the time lapse videos of people painting stuff or people painting magic cards that put a post up a time lapse video and you could tell they had no color scheme planned out they just just went in there and winged it and then halfway through you're watching the video and they're like wiping stuff out and you go aha <laughs> like you had no idea what you were doing sir <laughs> I own but it. I, yep. I, I own cannot. it too. I'm just like, yeah, I don't, I didn't know what I was doing and that's fine. <laughs> it's just yeah. like, I've somehow made it in the end. It's like, it's, uh, yeah. I tell my students, it's like when you, and it, everybody's got their own way, but I just, I look at it like you're getting in a car or you're in a car and somebody says, drive, drive where? Just drive. I'll tell you when we get there, right? <laughs> You just drive in a straight line and kind of hope that you don't slam into a wall or fall into the ocean or something like that. That's what it feels like to just stand in front of, have it be in front of a blank canvas and just start winging it. Just drive. But if you put in the GPS coordinates and you put the phone on the dash and you know you follow that, you're like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn this way and I'm going to turn. Then you you always hit your destination every single time. You don't get lost. You don't turn around and go back the way you came. (laughs) And that's, I don't know, maybe I'm just a little too rigid, but that's, that would, that guarantees that I don't waste my time. But I think it especially makes sense if it's for, for a client and you have a lot of client work, you need a process that's reliable and that, you know, you can hit the target every time. And I think it completely depends if your work is mostly fine art or personal work and you do want that you know whatever the finding to be an element in in your work as well then your process would look totally different so yeah. um but it makes perfect sense because if you're if you're looking for an efficient style because of the time like you're saying your time constraints like you have work life balance and all that stuff you have a family and all that stuff it makes perfect sense that you're going to want to streamline your process to be as efficient as possible yeah yeah but i i sometimes i wish i could just sit but in my sketchbook, I can just sit and just scribble out whatever and be happy with it. Um, but sometimes I wish I could just sit in front of a an easel and just stream of consciousness, just do do something and uh, come up come up gather references as I go and just make it happen. But this yeah. my brain just just doesn't work like that. Yeah. Um, so I mean I admire what both of you do and you know it's it's just a different 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 strokes for different folks I guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we all function differently and that's what makes it beautiful. Mm-hmm. We're all different artists. So naturally I, it would happen. Yeah. I did want to say real quick that one big part of my process now that wasn't as present early on because I was so self-conscious of even doing this is asking my artist friends for feedback, like as integral part of my process now. And it's like friends that will take time to give me paint overs or even just like verbal notes, you know, or whatever, just over text. But it's like, whenever I hit a brick, like a wall, I immediately text it to somebody instead of just like sitting there spinning, you know, or just staring at it. And then the other part that it's funny because I was talking to Greg Manchus recently and he said he does the same thing that it's like sometimes the process of like feels like I'm staring at my painting more than I'm actually painting it. <laughs> and I thought I was the only one. And it's like I realized that it's not that I'm procrastinating. I'm actually making decisions in my head. Yeah. Before I make the stroke because I don't want to waste my time remixing that freaking paint color, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. and repainting it over again. So I just wanted to say that for anyone who also paints that way, that, it, that you're fine. <laughs> Greg oh, Mantis yeah. says that you're good. <laughs> no, I, I do the same thing. Like I'm I'm I got a piece on the easel now where I have to sit there and make calculated decisions on what part of the piece I have to work on next and have to take into consideration how long Viridian Green takes to dry 
and Oof. do I use uh do I use some kind of medium to in to speed up the drying time so that it'll be ready for me to paint in the morning or do I let that just dry on its own or do I go thin do I add umbers what like you like there's a whole cooking show going on in my brain <laughs> yeah like okay well what recipe what ingredients do I do what do I do next then once yeah. you got it you know like okay then you can pick up your brush and do it yeah quickly yeah. There is so much internal processing that goes on. Like for me, I'm always checking, like zooming really far out. I'm like, does this read from far away? What do the gray tones look like? What is this composition even doing? And a lot of times, even after I've like created like some really like tight line art, sometimes I'll just like change a whole part of the composition because I'm like, I don't like this as much. I think this is better. And I like remake a decision in the middle of like just doing like the flat colors. That happened a lot with the Ivy and Oak piece. Um, and I was like, okay, like I'm always happy I've done it because it works for the better. But you have to like, you can't get married to everything that you're doing either. Like even with line art like mine, it's very easy to get married to it. But I'm like, no, like I just I can just erase this and and fix it because I know I'll be happier in the end. And yeah, can't be super precious either when you need to pivot. Just pivot. There's a reason why you got to do it anyway. Yeah. But yeah, it's interesting too because um, I was just doing a presentation for like a like some students earlier this week. And some of them are saying, like, what do you do, like, if you're art blocked and, like, you know, and you feel like you can't get better, like, at all? And I had to share the artistic improvement curve. Have y'all seen that? No. No. <gasps> I love this thing so much. So it's really easy, especially when you've been doing this for a while. You look at your art and you're like, I feel like I'm not getting any better or I feel like I'm getting worse or I'm plateauing or I'm like, I'm just not happy with anything that I draw. I saw this chart and... I, it like changed my life um, because it helped so much to frame what exactly was going on there. Um, and it was made by a user Shattered Earth, Shattered Dash Earth on DeviantArt. So thank you, Shattered Earth, uh, for this amazing chart. But I'm going to share my screen and we're going to look at this together. Okay. Oh. Have you seen this? No. No. You it's haven't heavy. seen it. Is amazing. So I'm just going to read it. Art is a cycle. Sometimes you draw really well, but sometimes you feel like you can't draw at all. In reality, you're always slowly improving. It's just a cycle of seeing versus drawing that makes you think you're doing worse. Understanding how this works can help an artist power through art blocks, for you are simply improving your ability to see and not get too cocky during art highs. So this is ability and this is time. And as you can see, your ability is always going up and time is always going forward. But your ability to see versus your ability to draw will constantly flux and shift. So as you're getting better at art, you think that you can, you're like, oh my God, like I am doing so well. This is awesome. And then you start to perceive better and you start to expect better quality. And then you look at the same picture and you're like, why is this trash? Like you could draw it a month ago and you're like, why is this trash? Because your ability to look and perceive quality is getting better. So you're improving in different ways and it's always like stacking up on top of each other. But when you feel like you're in an art low, you're prob your eye is probably just better. And when you feel like you're in art high, your eye might have plateaued while your art is like, you know, you found something that you really landed on that you like. Mm -hmm. But this helped me so much to frame it because I'm like, oh, my ability to see is getting better because I see all the mistakes in my art now. I want to do better. Why can't I do anything good? And it's just because I can see better. Yeah. And so this is a great way to frame it for anybody who's feeling stuck in their process or stuck in their art that they're making. I love this thing. I love that too. That's such That's a great heavy. explanation. Is there a way that we could share that with the class? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> um, I mean, I'm going to put a link to this in the, the YouTube uh, description. So anybody watching, uh, look down that description. There's going to be a link there for it. Um, and it's Shattered Earth on DeviantArt. So thank you again, Shattered Earth. Uh, you're amazing for making this because um, I haven't seen anything hit so dead on like this chart has. Yeah. So yeah, pretty awesome stuff. But it kind of helped me a lot too because I feel like I have been recharging my batteries a lot after being burnt out for so long and I'm ready to get back into it. But it's also really hard for me to like, feel happy with anything that I've made because I'm like, oh, like, I just want to do better art. And I feel like I just can't draw anything good. But 
because I've taken so much time to consume media and recharge my artistic eye and recharge the, my reference bank, my ability to see has gotten better. And so now my art is not keeping up with my ability to see, and I want to top up those expectations of what I want. And that's where I'm at right now. So yeah, it feels like a low, but I'm really like ready for the next step. So it's kind of exciting rather than feeling like an art block yeah. or an art block words. <laughs> I think at the beginning of any skill, like it's definitely you you perceive, I, I think there's a moment of false confidence where you're like, I'm doing the thing. I'm really good. And then it's that dip that happened immediately first where you're like, oh no, you see it like with clarity. You're like, oh no, I'm a total amateur at this, you know, and it's, <laughs> and it's painful. And then it gets to like a healthier point. I think over time as you're just seeing, like you're saying, you've gone through enough plateaus that you start realizing there's patterns to it. But that happened absolutely with my writing. And I noticed that every three months, it's like, I'm sort of like waiting for feedback or something like every two or three months. And when I turn it in at the deadline, I'm like, this is the best I can do. I'm so proud. And then by the time the feedback comes back, I'm like, oh God, this is so horrible. I see all these mistakes. <laughs> and I used to be like really tortured by that with a few times, but now I'm like, hey, that that means I'm actually improving every two or three months. I'm becoming a better writer because I can yeah. see mistakes. And like, yeah, that sucks that at some point I'm not gonna be able to fix it anymore, but I should just be, I actually am hoping I cringe at this first book in a few years because that'll mean I will have improved instead of plateauing. So that's yeah. at least I'm trying to see it now. Yeah, it's really comforting to know. It's just like, you're going to continue to improve and get better, especially as you practice. It's, 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 I mean, it's really apparent when you have a new skill yeah. because writing is a new skill and there's a lot of improvement when you start at the ground level, but that improvement is also rapid. It's like, it's like growing up, like, you know, when, when you see a toddler the next year, they're so much bigger than they were before. But then when they're adult, it's just like, oh, like you get incrementally, you know, taller or just you, just, you barely change. So I think the same thing is with art and like with any skill that you develop, like you start as a child and when you're a child, you grow rapidly. And then you hit a certain point where you're like, okay, like this is pretty solid. You're, that means you're just in your adulthood of art or whatever. And the only way you really drastically change or, you know, do a shift in quality is if you stop or if you do something to mix up that process or try different things and keep experimenting. Um, or you can be completely happy with what you're making and you just like, you just like where you're at and that's fine too. But, you know, it is fun to challenge yourself and try different things because I like the idea of having the skills to be able to do it, even if you don't want to do it. Like, just like, you know, I know how to paint realistic. I know how to do stylized stuff and all those things help to bolster what you can actually do what you want to do so yeah just keep learning and growing and embrace the process yeah I do have to say there's nothing like learning a new skill that then informs your painting or drawing and That's and I would recommend that to anybody if you're kind of like in an artist block like and you have another interest whether it's a musical instrument or you know writing or whatever or sport even I think that that will inform your art, even if it doesn't feel like it will, but just that process of learning and having to struggle and then seeing those quick results will actually probably energize you with your art. Cause it definitely has for me. So, and not that everyone's the same, but I'm just saying, I, I, I think there's enough patterns that I've seen where people kind of talk about either one art form sort of being the, the kickoff for inspiration for the other, like playing some music before they write or, writing before they draw and paint like they feed off of each other as well so there's that mm -hmm. there's that aspect too absolutely yeah but it's exciting anything else y'all want to leave us with before we go no all right well have fun everybody this is a fun process and it is really important to be able to go through it and experience how your life and your experiences and your interests and your hopes and dreams, your emotion informs your art, what you make, your process, everything. Because no two processes are ever going to look the same, even if they're similar. There's always going to be a way that we approach different things. We get taught certain ways and they culminate in some really unique pieces that you can't get anywhere else because all of us are human and we have human experiences and our art is a product of that. So please keep drawing, please keep practicing and please share your process. All right, everybody. Thank you for joining us in the live chat. We'll see you next time. Bye. <laughs>